So welcome, good morning everyone, and welcome to RSM's NetSuite user group event centered around the 21.1 release. My name is Adil Raymond. I'm one of the consulting directors within RSM UK's NetSuite consulting practice. <clears throat> um, thank you very much for taking time out of your undoubtedly busy schedules to join us. We hope that you will find this event uh, useful, getting a better insight into the latest functionality from a NetSuite perspective. Um, I'm delighted to see we have quite a few new attendees, so welcome to you uh, and thank you for joining us. To give you a bit of a background, uh, we developed this forum <clears throat> around a year ago, uh, centering around the new release functionality. However, our aim is to have uh, an avenue to speak to you about the product, but also to get feedback from you. If there are things that you would like to know more about from a NetSuite perspective, things that are important to you uh, and your businesses, and then please do reach out to us uh, and we'll factor that in into any <clears throat> uh, following sessions that we hold with you in the near future. Um, our intention has always been to run these events face to face. Uh, however, with the way that the events have transpired over the last year or so, it's meant that we've had to run these events uh, remotely to date. However, we are seeing light at the end of the tunnel now, so fingers crossed we will be getting into some semblance of normality and business as usual over the coming months. So we are optimistic, maybe towards the end of the year, we'll be start, uh, we will start being able to hold these events within our London offices face to face. And that will give us a chance to speak to you directly um, uh, about all things NetSuite and give you the opportunity to meet us uh, and, and talk about things that are important to you uh, from a product perspective. Okay. So a few things from a housekeeping perspective before we start. <clears throat> We'd love for you to ask us questions, so please do. Um, as we're going through the content, if anything springs to mind, if you do have a question, please use the Q&A functionality that's embedded within WebEx. You should see this function in the bottom right of your screen. Uh, if you're not seeing it, it's probably hidden, but you should see an icon with three dots on it. If you click on that, it should open up a Q&A function. So please do ask us questions, submit your question, uh, and we'll have a Q&A session at the end, uh, which will aim to answer the questions that have been received for our panelists. Also, a point to note, as we are running this event remotely, there is a chance that we could have some technical issues. We apologise in advance if we do have anything of that nature, but we'll try to navigate around it as seamlessly as possible. Okay, so what does today's agenda look like? So I'll shortly be handing over to my colleague Tim Evans, and Tim will be taking us through the 21.1 release, mainly focusing around the administrator, accounting and tax areas of functionality included within this release, before handing over to John Mackay, who will be focusing more on the inventory management, uh, supply chain and planning elements that have been included within this latest release, and discussing a few neat enhancements that we have in this area to complement the product. We're then joined by James Chisholm, who heads up the, the global product team there. So James will be uh, giving us an overview of what the product roadmap looks like from a shorter and longer term perspective, and giving us an idea on how nits we are investing in the product. And finally, we will have a Q&A session at the end where we will take your questions and we'll ask our panelists to answer the questions that we've received. Uh, we anticipate that this session will last around an hour and a half, depending on how many questions we get through. So, without further ado, I will hand it over to Tim. Tim, take it away. Thank you, Adil. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, a couple of housekeeping things on my side. Um, first of all, I currently have some people on my roof. Um, I live in a thatched cottage, as you can probably see from the um, beams behind me. Um, I've got some people doing some repair work on the thatch at the moment. So if there's a few bangs and things, um, you'll hear that. Um, I will also turn off my camera because countryside living, ancient BT wires, probably not a good thing to have all that bandwidth. So I will turn that off. So, and let's get into it. Okay. So um, what I'm going to talk you through is I'm going to start by talking you um, or talking you through the NetSuite release process. Um, so um, talk about what what happens to your account uh, during the upgrade, uh, how NetSuite pushes software out to you, um, and what steps you need to take. Um, I will then go through the 2020.1 changes highlights. Um, as Adil said, I will be focusing on accounting, taxation, administration, um, and my colleague John will then take you through the inventory and items and warehouse management. Um, and then I'll summarize with a call to action. So tell you what steps you should be taking 
as an administrator as your account is going through a release cycle. Uh, okay, so let's talk about the NetSuite release process. Um, okay, um, there are two, NetSuite delivers two major releases each year in Q1 and Q3. Um, this applies only to core NetSuite. So um, there are parts of NetSuite that are developed on the platform um, without wanting to sound too technical. Um, you may know these as suite apps or as bundles. They can be released at any time. Um, um, but the core NetSuite application goes through two releases um, in the spring and in the autumn in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, the upgrades are rolled out to use to customers in four phases. Um, so each cycle has four phases. Uh, a release preview account is available to you as a customer during this cycle. Um, NetSuite also makes available to you release information in the new release portlet. So you'll see this when you first log into NetSuite. It will say, welcome to release, and there's some key information in that portlet. Um, NetSuite also provide, you, uh, provide customers with new feature training in Suite Answers. Um, so they produce videos that you can sit through um, to learn about the new functionality that's coming in the new release. Um, that free training is published to you uh, at phase one of the release. So talking of the phases, there are four phases that it goes through. Um, at pre or pre-phase zero, um, NetSuite takes a snapshot of all production accounts. Um, it uses this for the release preview. Um, then at phase zero, some internal NetSuite um, databases are upgraded. So that's typically the accounts that NetSuite uses for its own internal development. At phase one, NetSuite's internal account is updated, plus a handful of uh, bleeding edge customers get upgraded. Okay. At phase two, roughly about 10% of customer accounts are upgraded. Um, and then at phase three, um, 30%. So by the end of phase three, um, about 40% of customer accounts are upgraded. And then at phase four, the remaining roughly 60% of accounts are upgraded. So as you can see in the leading edge of each phase, you can see when the release preview or how long the release preview is available to you. Um, NetSuite schedules the upgrades to avoid month end. So they typically occur on a Thursday night uh, around the middle of the month. So obviously they're aware that customers uh, are using their accounts quite heavily at nine o'clock on a Monday, so they don't obviously don't schedule them. Um, release preview accounts, as I said, are made available adjacent to each upgrade phase as shown by the gray bars. Okay, your exact date of release preview and upgrade are available in the new, new release portal. Well, they used to be, they've been a little more, um, uh, let's say imp a little more, a little less precise this release. Um, previously, they've told you the exact date that you would have been upgraded in the release portal. Now it's just giving you a, an approximate date. However, they do send campaign campaign emails to the primary contact on your account. So if you are the primary contact or you're the administrator or you are an administrator, you will get an email notification telling you when your upgrade is. Um, the tip here is to know your upgrade date and your release preview dates and plan accordingly. Okay, so um, when you get those email notifications, don't ignore them. Stick those note dates in your diary because you need to take action um, around the, around those dates, okay? Um, just be aware that if the new release doesn't come up, you may need to personalize it to, to, to see it, but it typically does come up um, in, in the lead up to your account being upgraded. Okay, so does NetSuite um, ever change the release dates? Uh, typically no, but it has happened in the past. Um, NetSuite endeavors to always stick to the published release schedule. So in other words, if it tells you when they're going to upgrade, they usually stick to that. Um, but obviously it's subject to quality assurance targets being met. Um, a few years ago, there was a release where the quality, uh, the QA targets were not met and the release was pushed quite significantly. So best practice is to keep an eye on the dates and the campaign email. So if the dates do change for whatever reason, you will get email notifications. So if they do change, again, make a note of it. Okay, what is release preview? Release preview is a play account you can use to test your account in the new 2021.1 version of NetSuite. So you can log in and it's a copy of your exact database. All your configurations and customizations deployed at the snapshot date will be available in the preview account. 
it will be available to you until your production account account is upgraded. Um, all the logins are preserved, although some functionality is limited. So things like um, eBay integration, I think, doesn't work. And if, a few other sort of minor integrations doesn't work. But all your customizations and all your scripts, um, all your um, custom fields, they will all be available in the release preview. All your workflows as well, importantly. Um, do you get a release preview? Well, the good news is that if you used release preview in 2020.2 and you did 100 or more posts, um, you will automatically receive a 2021.1 release preview account. The bad news is that if you did actually forget to log into the release preview in the last release, you'll have to re you'll have to request it. So if you need to know, or if you're not sure, if you go into setup company release preview, um, you can see your status from that screen. You can see in this account here, um, uh, that this client hadn't actually used their release preview in the previous release, so they've got to request it. Okay. Um, is the release preview fully functional? Generally, yes, but some functionality is limited. Um, I think, like I said, PayPal integration is limited. Um, some is not available, like Outlook integration. But importantly, as I said, all your customizations and integrations should work, and these should form the focus of your testing. Um, we recommend that you look at NetSuite's release preview test plan um, document to look at some more detail about what you should be testing. Um, and I will talk a little bit about that later. Okay. Okay, what happens to your sandbox during upgrade? This is a very important question. So standard sandbox accounts, they're upgraded after the production accounts. So if you're using a standard sandbox, um, you won't get it upgraded until after your production account is upgraded. However, if you have a premium sandbox, um, you may request this to be upgraded after phase one um, at your request. Um, it typically takes about five business days for it to happen. Um, the best practice, if you do have a premium sandbox and you are going to use this for your new release testing, um, is to refresh it before the upgrade. Um, this will typically give you, if you're in phase three, four weeks to test. And if you're in phase four, then that would give you six weeks to run tests. There's plenty of time in that release cycle for you to do that. One word of warning, though, is that if you do upgrade a premium sandbox, it cannot be refreshed until your production account is refreshed. So bear that in mind if um, you are going to use a premium sandbox environment for your testing. You may be stuck with it for a while. Okay, what happens to your account during an upgrade? Um, well, each upgrade phase is executed in a group of databases. Um, it's typically based on region to avoid downtime in peak business hours. Databases are assigned regional upgrade windows at each phase. So typically they start at, um, say, for the Asia Pacific, it starts at um, three o'clock in the morning. For EMEA, it starts at about 10 o'clock at night. And in the Americas, it starts at about eight o'clock in, in the West Coast time. Um, your specific upgrade date and time are typically displayed in the new release portlet. Um, they will show you a four hour window, uh, but the actual downtime depends on the amount of uh, data in your database. Um, most of them complete in less than two hours. During your maintenance window, your account and all your data is completely offline, so you can't log in during the upgrade. Um, this means online forms, website, web stores, web services, integration, they're all off. Okay. Um, you can sign up to be notified when the upgrade is completed um, at setup company general preferences. And you can see I've got it there and I've highlighted it for you. So if you tick that, you'll receive a notification when the account is back up. Uh, do make use of the new release dashboard portlet. Um, it's basically your information center for each new release. So as I said, it provides date and time for your release preview and your scheduled upgrade. Um, it highlights key features that are coming in the new releases, and it also provides link to online resources. Um, if you hide this portlet, then obviously you'll need to personalize the dashboard to bring it back up again. So the resources that are available, um, a new release overview, which is a video vignette of the new functionality that are coming, um, release notes, uh, full descriptions of the new features, sneak peeks are just basically marketing highlights of the new features, uh, release preview guide, uh, that is um, NetSuite giving you a high level strategy for testing and new release, including test plans. So definitely worth clicking on that one and adapting that to your organization. Um, and lastly, the training resources, um, all the new feature training videos, frequently asked questions, et cetera, 
are all available from in there. So if you want to look at the videos of the new functionality, um, click on that one and it takes you into Sweet Answers. Speaking of Sweet Answers, um, the videos are available. So if you go into Sweet Answers, click on videos, you'll see there's a link there to the new feature previews. Um, and again, you can sit through that. They are the NetSuite product owners. So it's the product owners, the people who actually develop the application, um, talking about what they brought to you in the new release. So definitely worth sitting through. Okay, upgrade messages. Um, you will receive upgrade messages. Um, the first one is sent typically within about two weeks in advance of phase one. This will include your release preview and upgrade dates. Um, it's a campaign email sent to whomever is the primary and upgrade notice contacts. The release preview amount and announcement is sent the day the release preview is available to you. Um, that is sent by in an in account notification to all administrators. So once you log in, you'll, you, you'll have seen these messages. They're the things you need to tick before it lets you log in. Like most of us, you probably just tick on it without bothering to read it, just get me in, get me in. But that's called an in, an in account notification. So do read that, you'll get one of those when the release preview is available. And then the release upgrade is sent one week before the upgrade. Again, that is sent via an in account notification to administrators, okay? Some upgrade rules to be aware of. Um, NetSuite cannot delay an upgrade of a sandbox after a production upgrade. So um, if you're using a standard sandbox, um, you can't stop that upgrade happening after your production has been upgraded. That can have ramifications if you're using a sandbox for a development environment. So that is something to think about, okay? NetSuite can upgrade a premium sandbox um, independently of the, of the um, as I said, it can be done one week after phase one, but it can't be refreshed before production is upgraded. So as I indicated before, if you're in phase four, you could have a long lag between when your premium sandbox is upgraded and then to when it can be refreshed again. So again, that is something to consider. Um, the release preview is never refreshed. So if you are using the release preview account, it's going to be that snapshot that was taken way back at pre-phase zero, and it will never be refreshed. So by the, if you're in phase four, your data is going to be quite old um, by then. Again, something to consider if you're using and you're undergoing development. It's going to be it's going to be quite right, um, quite out of date. Um, last thing, there is no rollback. Once you're upgraded, you are upgraded. You can't go backwards. There's no looking back in NetSuite's world, I'm afraid. Okay, so summarize the release process. Um, key, key takeaways, know your upgrade date, put it in your diary. Um, know your release preview dates. When is it gonna be available? Uh, know how to log into it. it. Should be fairly fairly easy. It just appears on your list of roles, um, but keep a note of when it's available. Consider the upgrade or the impact of the upgrade in your development schedule. So if you are currently undertaking development in your NetSuite environment, plan for that. Um, consider the upgrade of impact, the impact of the upgrade in your separate environments. Uh, I know some of you have multiple sandboxes and are using them for different purposes. So you need to think about that and think about how you're going to manage that process. Do you utilize the new release portal for the resources related to the new release? and utilize sweet answers for training and new functionality. It's a really good way to getting, for getting users trained in what's coming and what's changing. Okay, let's go on by talking about um, some of the changes for administrator. Now, I will be frank, and I've been around in NetSuite for a long time. Um, this release is not, a great, it's not a great one in terms of having a lot of functionality. It's actually a pretty, it's actually a pretty light one. Um, but nevertheless, there are some good things that are available in this release. Um, the first we're going to talk about is improvements in customer schedule maintenances. In 2020.1, administrators can now include notes about actions they took for a scheduled maintenance. So what is a customer schedule maintenance? So I discussed earlier about um, NetSuite pushes out an upgrade, but NetSuite has been moving to Oracle multi-tenant architecture. This will bring, it basically means that the way NetSuite is architected has changed um, a, a, a quite a lot, actually. Um, what's in it for you? Um, it means that your NetSuite account will ultimately be placed on its own database. Um, that will obviously give you an improvement in performance, but it will also allow you flexibility to schedule some maintenance at your own convenience. Um, at the moment, the only thing you can schedule is the Oracle database update, but new features will be added to this um, as time goes on. 
So what I suggest you do is you keep an eye on this um, in the setup company customer schedule maintenance and see what appears there because things will be added to that and you will be able to um, request um, or schedule when these maintenance occur. Um, and like I said, the change that's occurring this one is you're now able to add notes about what request you've made. Okay. Um, deprecation of NetSuite, NetSuite inbound single sign-on feature. Um, if you were using NetSuite's proprietary inbound single sign-on feature, I'm afraid it is no more. Um, you would have had notification about this in previous releases, so um, you will need to migrate to another single sign-on. Um, that's gone this release. Um, in the next or 2020.3.1, the outbound single sign-on, the proprietary outbound single sign-on will be deprecated. So now is the time, if you're using either of these, um, to move to another um, provider. If you need help with single sign-on, please do talk to us. We can help you with that. Um, hopefully nobody is in that boat because when you get upgraded, it will, well, certainly your inbound will stop working. Um, other key administration changes. Um, Changes to personal information removal, um, basically improve usability and performance in the, in the user interface when loading a large number of records. Um, if you're dealing with a large number of records, it's faster and less um, clunky. So in personal information removal, that's to adhere to um, uh, privacy laws, um, lets you remove lots of uh, personal information from your account in bulk. It's just been made a bit better. Uh, new help links in the application performance management tool Previously, if you wanted to look for the help, you had to go and find it in the help. Now there's actually direct links from the APM tool to the help topics, which is quite handy. Um, and a change to the available without login on file cabinet files. The reason I've called this out is because if you're pulling in files uh, into, your into your file cabinet using SOAP, um, it's now that available without login on the file will now be set to false. Previously, it would have been set to true. So, um, if you need that behavior, if you're reliant upon that behavior, you'll need to change your um, web services um, connection um, and specify that you want it to be available. Okay, let's look at accounting changes. Okay, advanced numbering. Um, this is new, this is quite nice, and I'm gonna demonstrate this. Um, NetSuite advanced numbering enables you to set up flexible document and transaction numbering that reflects the requirement of the countries in which you do business. What's in it for you? It basically enables you to create um, complex numbering sequences per transaction type, fiscal year, and other selected criteria. Advanced numbering automatically updates your document or transaction sequence, for example, when a new fiscal year begins, or you can create different types or different sequences for different types of transactions. So I am actually going to demonstrate this. So if you'll allow me to share my screen. Okay, so I'm going to go to set up auto generated numbers. So you can set Automate advanced numbering on transaction numbers. Um, so transaction numbers are transactions that NetSuite owns or instigates, um, or document numbers. They're transactions that NetSuite doesn't own or instigate. So um, vendor bills or invoices and credit card transactions. Um, these two number types work in tandem on transactions. I don't really want to go down a rabbit hole explaining them here, um, but do read the help if you want to understand the difference between a, a document number and a transaction number. Um, note that if you do enable um, advanced numbering, it doesn't mean that you're forced to use it on every transaction type. You can only set it for the transaction types that you're requiring, that you requ that you need. Um, advanced numbering uses rules and rule sets to number the transactions. Um, for example, you might define one rule around the company's fiscal year and another one around the location. Another one might be employee involved, etc. The set is the group of rules that apply to that transaction type. So let me explain. So under document numbers, you can see I have enabled it on a cash sale. So I'm going to go into the setup here. And you can see I've got two rules. It's got a standard cash sale rule, which I haven't modified. So that's obviously just the standard rule, start at one, keep going. Um, under the location and fiscal year, 
what I've done here is I've, you can see I've created a prefix, which I've specified using um, a little bit of HTML code for the location, and I've created a suffix for the um, fiscal year end. And I've set the sequence based on fiscal year and on location. So what that means is it's going to start a new sequence for every combination of fiscal year and location for every cash sale that I've done. And you can see if I go to numbering sequences based around the transactions that I've already put in the system, you can see it started a sequence based around the UK warehouse for fiscal year 2021, and the last used number is 1005. And if I look at my recent records, you can see there it is there. So UK 1005, which is what I've told it to do, I'm starting at one, initial number was 1000, and I'm now up to five. So UK 1005 2021. So if I quickly make a copy of this, and then save it, the next number that it generates should be 1006 UK, or UK 1006 2021, which it's done. Brilliant. If I go to another cash sale, this time US East, or a customer called Aperture, you can see because I've used location East Coast Warehouse, if I copy this, it's going to be 1002. Okay, which it's done. Do one last thing. I'm going to make another one, but I'm going to change the location to a different warehouse. So I'll change it to West Coast. So I should now get a different sequence. Which I've done, US West. Brilliant. Okay. Another thing you can do here is you can also set criteria. You don't need to do this, but if you want to do criteria and have um, um, different criteria for, say, like custom fields, or in this case, I've done currency, you can do so. So what I've done here is I've said that this only works if I'm using British pounds or US dollars. Okay. If I do a transaction in another sequence, then it's going to pick up one of the other rules. It'll fail this uh, rule, so I'd look for the next rule. So I've called one here called FX cash sale. Because it's down in the sequence, it's the next one that applies. All I've done here is I've just said the prefix is just going to be FX. So if I go back to my Baxter and Company, and if I make a copy, And this time I change the currency, so it's not GBP, it's euros, and save it. You'll see instead of being UK 1007, it's now FX, completely different sequence. And there it is. Okay. Um, it's quite a nice feature. Um, I can see it would be really useful for things like tills. If you're a retailer and you had a lot of tills, I can see something like this could be quite useful to you. So if you had a lot of high volume transactions coming in and you needed to have very specific sequences, you can do so. Okay. Okay, next feature, um, new account numbering behavior. Um, if you use numbers on your GL accounts, Nets will no, now no longer add the number to the name field. Um, why am I calling this out? Um, it's because it brings the name of the or the name field in GLCANs into line with other records. This has the, this could have the potential to be disruptive if you're reliant upon the name field to provide an account number, say in a search or a report. And you can see I've got, I'm showing you there what the difference is. You can see the name field in 2020.2 includes the number, but in 21.1 no longer does. So if you are using that field in a search, um, just be aware it will now no longer include the number. The display name, however, will still dis display the number. Okay. okay. Um, nice new feature that's coming. And this is something that I did actually want to demonstrate to you. 
Um, but unfortunately, sandboxes don't email, so I couldn't do this. Um, what it is, it's a new ability to approve um, transactions via an email. So previously in NetSuite, if you were using suite approvals, um, it would send you an email, but then you had to log into NetSuite to actually approve the transaction. Now you can actually do it from the email. So if you're on your iPhone or whatever, you can just click on a button in the, in the email and then the transaction gets approved, which is quite nice. So it brings it into line with other applications like Cooper, um, Expensify and things like that. Um, be aware that suite approvals is a different to suite or NetSuite approvals workflow, which is basically the three-way matching on purchase transactions. Suite approvals extends approvals to many more transaction types. You can, of course, use both suite apps simultaneously. So you might be using suite approvals and you might be using NetSuite approvals workflow. That's perfectly fine. If you think this is something that you could be interested in and might want to use, um, by all means, we're willing to help you with that. So just drop us an email. Um, what is this country specific report suite app? Um, it's basically a new suite app to allow you to create, edit, and view complex financial reports. So profit and loss balance sheet, et cetera, for different countries. So previously NetSuite only supplied financial reports for the US, Australia, the UK, Japan, and then there was international. So anywhere that was international that didn't fit into those countries, you basically had to configure it itself. This is basically a, extending that or new framework to allow you to build um, a financial reports for specific countries. So it, you could be buying these reports from a partner, from a localized partner or something, and this framework will allow you to deliver it. Be, more, be warned that it's not point and click. You need to create raw, uh, report templates using HTML or XML, or indeed, like I said, get them from a partner and upload the file to NetSuite. Um, so yeah, it's not like the standard uh, report or financial report builder that is point and click, you need to know HTML or XML to do this. Okay. But it just means, like I said, the, the big takeaway here is if you are setting up in, I don't know, the Middle East, you'll probably find a partner who's going to create these reports for you and you'll now, you've now got the framework to get them into your NetSuite account. Other key account changes, um, balancing segments or balancing by segment status in transaction search. This is a new status field you can use in searches to help with transactions that have imbalanced segments. For example, if you need to balance by region, say, um, you could create an alert whenever a transaction is posted that didn't balance. So that's quite a nice feature. Um, UI updates and fixed assets. Um, field labels and reports are no longer abbreviated. Um, it did look a bit not, not great before. Now it looks much better. Advanced localization features. Um, this is a new suite up to allow you to create localized printable invoices and credit notes. You can add additional fields to subsidiary and customer records. Data in these fields can then be included in those printed forms. You've always been able to do this manually, but of course this new suite up makes managing this easier across multiple geographies. So previously, if you wanted to do this, you had to have a separate form, one for Germany, one for France, one for da So with this new suite up, you don't have to do that. The suite up just manages that and you can still use the same form. So it's quite nice. Um, China, China localization enhancements, um, changes to make NetSuite more compatible with Chinese financial reports and the golden tax system. Um, Germany localization suite up, uh, a new German chart of accounts can be imported. Uh, there are also enhancements to German financial reports and a region field has been added to the German VAT report. Uh, Netherlands and Belgium localization, um, updates to bring in the VAT or bring the VAT returns, EU sales and interstate reports in with the latest requirements. And Portugal, um, a new ability to generate a QR code on the fiscal relevant documents. So um, worth keeping that up to date. Okay, let's look at banking. Um, deprecation of legacy reconciliation pages. So these are the old NetSuite reconciliation bank statement and credit card functionality these will be deprecated during this release cycle. So you need to migrate to the new reconciled account statement functionality now. So if you haven't done so, you need to start thinking about when you're gonna do that um, in this release cycle. Um, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, um, talk to us. Um, we've, we've developed some expertise in this. So we can help you with that migration and connect you to um, your banks or connect you to your bank accounts for automatic statement downloading. Uh, if you need or if you want that.
Uh, next thing, um, coming soon, um, Bank Feed Suite app for Asia Pack. Um, new ability to create or imp import transactions from Asia Pack banks, Commonwealth Bank, Bank of New Zealand, Bank of Singapore, etc. Um, so previously, you could have used the financial institutions connectivity suite app to manually configure an SFTP connection. Now you've got a point and click um, suite app that does it for you. Similarly to what came out in um, EMEA in the last release, it's now going to be available um, for Asia Pack. So if you're doing business out in Asia, um, this is one for you. Um, other key banking changes are um, enhancements to bank import. Um, um, previously to 2020.1, an import failure for one bank or credit card account during the import caused the entire import to fail, which was a bore. And also the error logs were confusing. It didn't clearly indicate where the issue was. So in 2021.1, bank data imports can now be partially complete, even when the import fails for some accounts. So it doesn't basically stop. It'll continue the import and then be clearer about where the error was. Um, clear account transactions on the match bank data page you can now mark account transactions that do not have imported bank lines to match as cleared pending submissions. Basically, this functionality mirrors the CLR functionality in the old um, bank reconciliation screen. So if there's nothing to match, you can still clear it basically if you need to. Okay, let's look at vendors and purchasing. So a new thing that we've got, or the next we're bringing out now is centralized purchasing. This is big news because people have been asking for this for a long time. Um, you have always been able to do this through um, manually through intercompany transfers, but now it can be automated. So in one purchase transaction, you can select the vendor and the items you need, then you nominate them on the, on the line to where they should be sent through the new target subsidiary and target location fields. Each location will then therefore process its own uh, item receipt upon receipt of the order. Billing is then done back from the main purchase order. The centralized purchasing and billing feature enables the automation of intercompany cross charges between the billing subsidiary and the target subsidiary. You can set the automation to automatically run when the accounting period closes. So it's quite nice. So the head office can do all the purchasing, purchasing, the branches can do the receiving, and then the head office can then um, make the payments. Um, and then all the cross company charges will all post automatically. So it's a very, very, very nice feature. Okay, other key vendor changes, um, NetSuite bank payments. Um, uh, if you're using ele electronic bank payments in NetSuite, it now supports multi-subsidiary customers and vendors. Um, previously, you had to go in and bugger around and change the primary bank account. Um, you no longer have to do that. Um, if you're using multi-subsidiary customers and vendors, it is now supported. Um, it also now supports vendor prepayment transactions. So if you're creating a vendor prepayment, that's where you pay a vendor upfront before you've received the bill, you can now process that payment and then include it in um, an instant batch file to be sent to the bank. Previously, that wasn't possible. Um, you can now print vendor bills and vendor credits. Um, I don't understand this myself. This is something that customers I know have asked for a lot, but I don't understand why you'd want to print a vendor bill. The customer, the vendor sent your bill. Why don't you print that? But anyway, you can now then print the NetSuite vendor bill transactions if you need to. Um, another nice thing is create bill from item receipt. Um, this is relevant if you're using advanced receiving, which is where you separate your item receiting from your um, turning it into a, into a uh, purchase invoice. Um, previously, you could receive the item, process the item receipt, but then you had to go back to the purchase order to create the, the, the purchase invoice, the bill. You no longer have to do that. There will be a create bill from the um, um, item receipt page, which is quite nice. And lastly, um, default vendor payment account. So you are now able on a vendor record to default from which payment account they should be made, which is quite nice. Okay, order management. I uh, don't think there's a lot of changes in order management. Um, invoice group feature enhancements. Um, Um, so, um, okay, so let's look at some of these. Um, required deposit workflow um, is a new flow that can enforce collection of a deposit on a sales order. 
Um, that can be based on items, percent of sales order value or ended values. So if you um, require deposits, um, you can enforce that. So when the, when you're pr processing a sales order, it will force the user to then um, get the deposit from the customer or process the deposit. Um, Multi-language support for return authorization from cases. Um, if you are creating um, cases from a return authorization, typically this is done um, warehouse w, a lot of WD or warehouse distribution customers might do this. Um, we can now do this in multiple languages, which is quite nice. Bill of landing suite app, which is a new suite app for generation of bill of landing documents for exports. Um, if you export, this may be relevant for you with the Brexit changes. Uh, lot and serial number trace suite app. This is a new suite app to trace components from a supplier to an end customer. Um, trades can be forwards or backwards, which is quite nice. Uh, and installment billing enhancements. If we are using installment billing, um, that can now be split across the installments. Previously, it was collected on the first installment, making the installments uneven. It's probably more compliant as well, I would think. Okay. Reporting and analytics changes. Um, there is nothing of note for safe searches and legacy reports. However, some nice features in Suite Analytics workbooks. Um, first off, calculated measures. Um, these are custom measures that you define by creating a calculation from existing measures and basic operators. In other words, a calculation run in the report using data in the workbook, for example, a percent profit or something like that. Um, you can now um, create as many calculated measures as you need in your workbook which is quite nice. So it's a calculation on the fly in the workbook, basically, which is very nice. Conditional formatting. Um, you can now apply conditional formatting to a workbook table um, and pivot table results. Um, it basically highlights the results in the workbook, um, helping to call attention to certain results. So highlight all the customers that are over 90 days overdue, for example, or highlight any values that are over 10,000 pounds or whatever it is, okay? It basically mimics the functionality that was available in Save Searches or has been available in Save Searches. Um, changed IP addresses. Um, the IP addresses of Suite Analytics Connect servers are changing and they will continue to change in the next few releases. Um, the takeaway from that is you should not use IP addresses in your firewall configurations to access the Connect service. You should use the domain name only, okay? So if you're using IP addresses, don't use the domain name. Um, okay, taxes. Everyone loves taxes, including accountants. Okay, legacy taxes. Uh, legacy tax changes to support Brexit. Um, there are new import codes for postponed VAT accounting, and there are updates to the VAT 100 and Interstat reports to properly report the movement of goods between Great Britain and the EU and Northern Ireland and the EU. So make sure that you get your um, international tax bundle updated um, so that you remain compliant. Some other key changes, um, period end journal support in tax audit files. So if you're using tax audit files and you are posting period end journals, they can now be included. Um, Finland support, there's a new reverse charge VAT code for Finland for recording import of services from outside the EU. So again, it's making it more compliant for Finland. And there's a Germany annual VAT rate update. Um, these are changes to support Germany's um, COVID-19 responses. So again, make sure you're kept up to date so that uh, you are up to date. If you're on sweet tax, um, some key changes, multi-book and adjustment only book support. This is a big one. Um, sweet tax has not previously to this release um, been compliant with multi-book. Uh, it now is. So if you are using multi-book and you want to migrate to sweet tax, you can now do so. Um, there's now handling for new uh, Mexico deferred taxes. So there's another suite up that it uses to, to handle that. There's localization enhancements for both um, Belgium, Netherlands, and of course the UK, um, obviously brought about because of that. So this is basically the same changes that we made in legacy tax are also reflected in sweet tax. Okay, I'm now going to hand over to my colleague John McKay, and he's going to talk you through the item and warehousing changes. Okay, thank you very much, Tim. Um, everybody hear me okay? Share my screen. Okay, just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, firstly, uh, I will have my video on because I've 
cut my hair, especially for this uh, for this day. Uh, and second point is that um, I have a little uh, Shih Tzu Maltese um, dog called Ralphie. He could bark at any time, especially if you have an Amazon uh, delivery. So um, you may well hear him if that happens. So apologies in advance. Okay, so my name is John Mackay, and I'm the head of professional services at FHL, which is RSM's NetSuite practicing crew. I'm responsible for NetSuite implementations, integrations, and customizations, and have uh, two teams reporting into me. And I've been with the firm for over 10 years now. Okay, what I'm focused on today is NetSuite 2021 uh, release changes for inventory and warehouse management in particular. So the key changes NetSuite have made in 2021.1 release are around demand and supply planning, warehouse management, and quality management. NetSuite have been putting a lot of effort into recently improving inventory management over the last few years with a vast, vastly improved warehouse management system, improved quality management tools, and much improved repository-based MRP tools. And I'm going to talk and walk you through some of these changes over the next few slides. So what I, want to, what I want to start with is demand and supply planning. So NetSuite have improved the tools for demand and supply planning over the last few releases. We've gone from separate views of demand and supply to a single workbench repository-based view that helps planners to view demand and supply together in one place and perform actions such as work order or purchase order generation to allow transactions and plans to be managed more effectively. The repository is scriptable also, which means that development work can be undertaken to provide customizations, for which I have an example, which I'm going to show you over in the next few slides. For demand and supply planning, previous enhancements in 2020.2 made huge improvements to the way the demand and supply plans are managed through the planning workbench. The workbench takes in demand plans, which are based on sales history and current pipeline. And there are a number of calculation methods for plan generation, such as linear regression and moving average, amongst others, and uses the demand plan to generate a supply plan, which also takes into consideration supply lead time and buffer stocks. It uses the plans to suggest work orders and purchase orders to meet the supply plan. For 2020.1, um, 2021.1, sorry, a, a new column that date based view has been provided that shows the plans on screen as a calendar view rather than separate lists and providing clarity and visibility and making it easy to run and show scenario changes. The workbench date based view shows demand across the top, sales orders and transfer orders to show complete demand confirm purchase orders and work orders and plan work orders and purchase orders. It provides a much easier way of consuming the plans. It's just easier on the eye. Planning repository allows safe searches to be created for demand data and supply planning results that enables you to run ad hoc reports and analysis. 2021.1 also takes into consideration blanket purchase orders, which makes the view more accurate. So I'll, I'll just bob into NetSuite now and show you what that looks like. So we go to transactions and we go to supply planning and supply definitions. Just move this window out of the way. So if I, um, these show the um, supply plan definitions where you can group items together. Um, each one of these supply plans in this instance only has um, one assembly in it. So I'll click on the results. And this now shows me um, the planning workbench. And um, what this gives you is the ability to look at your uh, assembly and um, the subcomponents. So in this instance, I've got a an assembly salty chocolate crunch sleeve with the subcomponents. So you can see the raw materials and it allows you to drill into that as well to show them linked. Over here on the right hand side, you can see the supply and demand. So if I click on the supply in this instance, we can see the planned work orders that it's suggested. And we can also click on the demand plan, which I referred to earlier as your pipeline. So history and sales orders. 
Um, and this is what you saw previously, but what now NetSuite gives you is this nice little um, clock icon here. And if I click on that, that gives me the ability to look at it in this column of the date based view, um, which is uh, much easier to read. So for instance, um, one of the orders we looked at a moment ago, um, there's a uh, 50 planned order here and 111 planned order here to meet the demand that um, we've got at the top um, up here. So um, this just is um, how most of um, our clients would expect this to work rather than just having simple uh, lists. And um, so um, quite, a, quite a bit of an improvement. Okay. As I mentioned, the demand and supply planning repository is scriptable. So in order to show this, we produce a customization that shows how. Uh, the option I'm going to show you provides a single view to release um, all works orders and purchase orders so that purchase order, purchase order and work orders can be created as part of the MRP. The screen provided is Sweetlet that shows a single list that saves a user hopping around in the supply plan from assembly to assembly. And I'm going to show you what that looks like now. I'll just go over to NetSuite again. So I go to transactions and we've dropped this um, particular menu item onto the supply planning transaction creation section here. So this option here now is a customization, um, not that much code involved in it, but basically we've provided option here to select the location. You can unmark or mark all, you can select individual orders on here. Um, and um, you can then choose to release those orders. And you may have uh, dozens of these work orders and purchase orders on screen here. And ordinarily what you would have had to have done is go into each of the plans, go into each of the um, demand areas or supply areas, uh, and then release the orders that way. So this just um, provides a bit, saves a bit of time, but it just demonstrates how the actual uh, repository is scriptable also. Other changes for 2021.1 uh, for demand and supply planning are that the master production schedule and materials requirement plan can be viewed together in a single place. The high impact late demand threshold uses supply planning workbench logic to set a threshold for items and locations. If the late demand threshold is exceeded, a color highlights the issue in the supply planning workbench, drawing your attention to it. As I've mentioned, the repository is scriptable and it's also available for reports. So safe searches and analytics reports, um, work um, books can be, um, can be created um, as per your requirements. And I'll show you that in a moment. The supply repository refresh can be scheduled also to bring the latest changes into the repository. And also REST and CSV interfaces have been provided to allow data to be imported into the repository. So for instance, if you're, if you're creating a demand plan in an external tool, such as Anaplan, you can export that and import that into NetSuite. And also REST services have been provided uh, to allow seamless integration into, into extra, um, into, into, uh, with external applications, sorry, should I say. So I'll just drop into NetSuite now and show you the, um, the repository um, usage. So what I'm gonna do, um, I'm just gonna bob into analytics here. And um, analytics, if you've not used it before, it's it's an extension to save searches. Um, one of the big advantages is that you, you can create uh, data sets that can be used throughout um, different workbooks. And it allows multi-level joins, whereas save searches only allow you to go down a couple of levels. So it provides um, a, a much more gra um, graphical way of creating the, um, the reports as well. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new data set and I'm going to use one of the repository um, data data uh, tables called um, planned orders. Select that here. And I'm just going to um, select some of the um, columns here to use on this report. So it's already put the internal ID on, on here, but what I want is, is the item. I want the start date. And I want the quantity. Okay, so relatively straightforward I, i've not this isn't the report this is the uh, data set what i'm going to do now is create the report so i'm going to create a new workbook based on this and what i'm going to do is use a new feature uh, that we've had over the last couple of releases called uh, pivots i'm not sure if you've used these you might be familiar with them in excel but you can now do this within workbooks it's quite powerful 
uh, it gives you a very similar view to the way you would see it in, in, in um, Excel. So what I'm going to do is drag my item into a, a row. I'm going to drag my um, quantity into the data and I'll drag my start date um, as the um, row heading, uh, the column heading, sorry, for the tabulate report. I, I want the day. Um, so I will go down to day here in the columns and I'll remove month, quarter and year. So now I've got item start uh, date, which is the day and the quantity, which is summed. And I'll just run this um, pivot report. And you can see it very quickly, we've been able to show all the planned orders summarized for days through March. Um, so quite easy to do, but it shows you the ability to actually use the repository also in reports. So on to order enhancements. In, in 2021.1, a new order management dashboard has been provided that is customizable. Um, and this is a predefined dashboard, comes out of the box and is useful to anyone tracking order metrics, chasing orders, reserving supply and reallocating stock. Um, so I'll just bob into NetSuite again and show you that. So we go to transactions and order management, go to order management dashboard. Just let that load. Okay, so um, just talk you through this. Um, we've, we've got some um, options over here with regard to reserving supply and order reservation, um, allocating orders and reall reallocating items with current inventory. We've got some reports here that are um, consolidated. So sales by customer, order scorecard, etc. But as per any dashboard, you can customize this. So I can go into personalize, um, drop on some reminders over here, um, set it up. And we'll, I wanna see fulfillments. So I'll add fulfillments to this, save it. And now we've got um, a reminder for orders to fulfill on here as well. So uh, just a, a dashboard, uh, the dashboard provides a useful set of metrics, um, summary reports and actions grouped into a single view and will be available to all when, when your account's um, upgraded. Okay, now on to WMS. WMS or Warehouse Managers Management System has improved and consolidated NetSuite's warehouse offer over the last few releases. So we've, we've had a big improvement in this area. Um, I'm just going to pick out a couple uh, of improvements over the next few slides for outbound and inbound processing and mobile and pack station improvements. For inbound processing, NetSuite have made uh, a few improvements. For warehouse locations that use bins, NetSuite WMS introduces the ability to process cart moves for received items on a mobile device. So they, they've improved the mobile offering. For, put, for put away operations, you can now change the status of inventory. So if there was an issue with the stock, you could flag it up at the point at put away. For outbound processing, a number of significant changes have been made, notably bulk order picking. NetSuite can now generate a consolidated order quantity for the same regular inventory or lot item across all orders in the picking wave. You can now schedule wave release uh, as well. So NetSuite WS now provides the ability to schedule the release of a wave transaction for sales or transfer orders. It submits a job that generates a, a release and releases the wave transaction. And on a mobile device, you can now generate and release waves for single orders. And this is something a couple of our clients have been looking for. Um, the single order picking page now displays options for unreleased orders and released orders. When you when you select the unreleased orders, you can choose the orders to include and release in a wave transaction. Twenty twenty one dot one sees a significant improvement also in label printing for warehousing. During mobile application processing. On any WMS mobile transaction where a quantity is being captured by a user, a label can automatically be generated and you can set up multiple label types as well. So it should be able to accommodate most label production requirements for most of our clients.
For clients that have customers that have inventory shelf life requirements, NetSuite will now allocate numbers to sales based on first expiry, first out basis or, or FIFO. This suite app can allocate lot numbered items based on customer shelf life requirements and minimum order fulfillment needs. And this is a requirement that probably would have needed a customization previously. Okay, on to quality management. So NetSuite provides a set of quality management tools that allow a templated rules-based auto, auto generation of inspection records for transactions, such as item receipts and work order production points. For instance, you can define a template that generates an inspection record for a certain item or vendor or, or combination of both or location on say every five, item, five item receipts received, or, or for instance, you may have an issue with a particular item from a particular vendor and you want to inspect it every single time because you've been having a quality problem with it. NetSuite allows inspection templates to be created that are grouped together into specification records. And generated inspection records can be filled out on a mobile device through the quality mobile application. And I'll just um, bob into NetSuite to, to show you that. So when you've got um, quality uh, implemented, you get a little menu here and uh, we have inspections and specifications. I'll just go into inspections first of all to show you what uh, that looks like. So here we have um, three inspections on particular items. I'm just gonna go into that and show you that. Just bear with me whilst that loads. Okay, so um, what this uh, shows you is um, the, the frequency in which the inspection is going to uh, take place. Um, the data that we're going to um, capture, um, so in this instance, we've just got the number of um, samples inspected and the defect count, but you can add as many fields as you like to this as well. We define the um, pass and, and fail criteria also here. Um, what you can then do with those inspection records is group them into specifications. So you can um, put many of these inspections into um, a, a many of the inspections into a specification. So in this instance, I've got my barbecue P uh, specification. Show you what that looks like. So here, um, you can see this is actually referring to the inspection record I showed you a moment ago. It has a context which says for this item, which is a barbecue P, um, and for a receipt on a purchase order for this location, uh, and you can also set the vendor as well. Um, if there's a fail, and um, we're going to return the raw material to the supplier. And we have some um, conformance rules here as well. So. Um, there's also a quality um, a mobile application, which will run a tablet, which I'll show you in a moment. So improvements uh, to um, quality management um, is that um, for 2021.1, um, the mandatory inspection flag has been moved to the data fields, which allows um, the, um, the, the mandatory um, elements of this to work at the field level. And a couple of additional field types have been included in this release, a, a drop down list that you can predefine with your own values uh, and a URL field to allow access to a specification um, to a specification doc product documentation, um, such as images, um, which could be stored, for instance, in the file and cabinet or, or held in a document store, such as box. So quality management is fully scriptable and the record structures are available for saved searches and workbooks. Um, FHL, have, uh, sorry, RSM have created a small customization that allows ad hoc inspection records to be generated on a work order on the fly. Um, so I'll just um, show you how that works. So if I go to transactions and manufacturing and go to list work orders, <coughs> Let's go into my work order at 66. So 
Just wait for that to load. Okay, so what I've done in this instance um, is I've I've added a button here for to generate an ad hoc inspection record, and there's a field down here as well to allow me to enter um, fail uh, information. And what I can do is I can click on that, and that will actually now appear as an inspection record in my tablet application. So I'll just load the the tablet view up. <clears throat> Here's my um, inspection record for work order 66. So if I click on that now, um, this allows me to enter a serial number or lot number and enter the samples inspected and how many defects I had. And then I can record that uh, and, and that will be on, on, the, um, on the records with regard to um, the data we've collected. Now on to the um, pack station, uh, which is brand new for 2021.1. The new pack station mobile application extends order fulfillment processing in your warehouse or any location that uses a kiosk device. It supports multi-level packing that allow, lets you pack items into cartons and then transfer pack cartons onto pallets. It can be used with or without WMS. Uh, the pack station is a touchstream mobile application developed to be used on a tablet. It increases efficiency for packing operations and administrators with the goal of maximizing order and shipping accuracy. And sh some of the new functionality included is um, packing multiple carton orders, verifying items using um, scanning, multiple shipping routes, pack partially picked orders, picking labels and picking lists, palletization and shipments and, and staging after packing and, and it's got better find order uh, quickly functionality. The pack station also provides for printing cart labels, pallet labels and picking lists via the pack station and also weights can be captured automatically into NetSuite from your from your weighing device. So um, that's it for my um, slide deck, and um, I think it's back to you, Tim. Thank you very much. Great presentation. Okay. I am just now going to talk you through your call to action. So we went through the release process. Um, you know what the process is. You know what's coming in terms of the um, new release. So now we need to talk about what you need to do between now and when you get your new release. So basically, you just need to test. You need to make sure that the new release does not break your critical processes in your business. Um, you need to identify any of the new functionality that's coming that may be of use to you. Um, and then you need to develop a migration plan from existing processes to the new functionality. So, for example, in the previous release, we had um, vendor prepayments that came along. Um, there were workarounds that you had to do um, in order to pay vendors in advance. So some customers had to do a migration from the old functionality or from their old workaround to the new functionality. So testing the new release, um, NetSuite does provide you um, with uh, release preview test plans. So um, the link is available in the, new, in the new release portlet. So download that test plan uh, and create a plan for each of your critical workflows. It's basically an Excel worksheet um, that is a testing matrix. So um, it gives you examples of what you might need to do. So, for example, you might need to do the the, the, the a test plan might be the um, cycle of an order. So when an order comes in from a customer through to payment, uh, and you might want to go through every step in that in that process. Um, um, the best practice is to work with the process owners within your business. Um, make them responsible for testing their own area of NetSuite. Don't make one person responsible. Break it up. So make sure the payables people do their bit. Make sure they can still pay vendors. Make sure that the fulfillment people can do their part. Make sure that the sales people can record um, a quote and it doesn't break whatever they're doing. Particularly important if you've got um, 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 workflows. So if you're doing workflows or any customizations in NetSuite, it's particularly important that you test them uh, as part of that whole business process flows. Um, but having said that, don't confuse business workflow with the workflow in NetSuite. 
Um, the idea is that you're testing your end-to-end -end process in the release preview, which may or may not involve obviously a NetSuite workflow. Um, okay. Um, testing the new release. Um, you should be testing your business workflows, um, any custom reports and forms that you're running. So if you've got custom reports that are critical, make sure they're not broken by the new release. Uh, any forms that you've got, um, any other customization. So if you've got custom records um, and they're interacting with standard records, make sure that's working. Uh, any suite scripts that you've got, um, make sure they're working. Um, test your web services integrations. Um, test any installed suite apps that you have. Um, and lastly, test your web store and your suite analytics connect. So make sure that's still working. Um, looking at new functionalities of interest, um, NetSuite is constantly being improved. New functionality gets added all the time. Um, maybe introducing old functionality. And the, a good example is the new bank, rec, uh, bank reconciliation. So the best practice is to review the release preview notes and release training early in the release cycle to identify any new functionality that you may want to migrate to in the new release. Okay. Um, so um, I'm now going to hand over to James, who's going to talk you through um, the product strategy and roadmap beyond 21.1. Take it away, James. Thanks, Tim. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, and, and also see the slides. Um, so thanks everybody for joining. Um, I'd just actually like to shout out to Tim and John, um, uh, kudos for, for a great presentation. Um, it's always pleasing um, to see the, the features that we, we build and develop here articulated in, in such a great way. Um, so I'd urge everybody on the call, if anything is of interest, you know, please do speak to RSM. Um, you know, there's some good stuff in here. So, so I'm James Chisholm, Senior Director of International Products. I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about our product strategy and roadmap. Um, hopefully, give you some insight into that. Um, before I kick off um, and get into the detail, I, I have to show you a safe harbour statement. Um, so we will talk a little bit about some futures. Please don't make any buying decisions based on what you may hear or see here today. Um, you know, Tim, you know, really did a great job of articulating some of the things that we've done, um, not only in core products, but also, you know, at some of our platform offerings and, and some of that actually revolves around this message, our act global, be local uh, theme. Um, so localization is really important to us. So many of you may have subsidiaries and operations in other countries. So that remains a big priority for us. You know, part of my role looking after JPAC, EMEA, um, and Latin America is to ensure that our customers are well served everywhere outside of North America. So again, I'm glad that, that Tim um, highlighted some of those capabilities that we continue to introduce into the product over the course of the, the releases. So product strategy, I'm going to try and keep it light. Um, I know probably people are looking uh, to, to get to, to, to have some lunch and uh, back to, to the day job. Uh, but I do want to just, you know, uh, reiterate kind of how we do some of this stuff and a bit of a call to action for you and, and RSM. So the, the, the way we look at it and the way in which we develop products, you know, you've seen a, a lot of the new things that we're, we're, we're doing uh, today. Um, and we will continue to do those things. But I wanted to just share with you a few things about how we, we think about this and, and why we do it and how we deliver it. Um, and so it's in three kind of areas here. It's the who, it's the how, and it's the why. Um, so if we look at who, you know, most of the things that you'll see, and again, it's nice that RSM split it up today a little bit. We think very much about the industry that you work in and make sure that we try and deliver features that are relevant to the business that you're in. That's important to us and that, that works with our suite success um, uh, capabilities and how we deliver product now to, to all of our customers. Country is, is pivotal. Um, we have a lofty ambition of making NetSuite feel like it's been developed uh, for those users in each country in which we work. 
you know, so we want to deliver local capabilities to, you know, really heighten the user experience. So, so a country footprint will remain important to us. And then finally, you and your role, what you do in the organisation. You know, these things, ERP can be complex. Um, you know, we want to deliver, again, the experience tailored to your role to enable you to do things simply and easily. Um, you know, uh, it's incredible that we've all been you know, working at home and things now for, for, for a year. Um, so it's important that we think about, you know, how people are using NetSuite and, and how we can make it simpler based on your role. And then there's the how. And again, so how you know, you've seen some of that in action today. And we again, we split this into pillars. Um, it's about analytics and, and John showed you some of Suite Analytics and the, the, the new capabilities that we've intro introduced there to understand a little bit more about, you know, how your business is run and some of the processes. There's intelligence, you know, we will be introducing more intelligent features uh, to give you information, you know, within NetSuite at the right point of time. Um, and as I've said, experience. The other thing that you may not have, have heard, we do, we do like to use the term suite. Uh, as of next week and, and that's sweetness um, and what sweetness means to us is is making sure that you get most value out of your investment in NetSuite you know there's lots of things that we do um, and it's how we can unlock some of those capabilities so again as I said at the top of the presentation please if there's anything that you've seen today talk to RSM and see how you can leverage that because that builds into our notion of sweetness getting the most value out of what you have with NetSuite, you know, there's there's lots of things there. Pick the things that are right for you, and you know, try and make time to to make use of them. And then there's the why. Um, I think you know why for us today is hugely important. You know, but we're living in a very different world, um, and things like visibility, modernization, productivity, collaboration, are absolutely key. You know, in our 20 plus years of history, we've never delivered a solution that sits on premise. Um, everything that we do is within the cloud, delivered over the internet. That message right now is more important than ever. Um, you know, as we sit at home and, you know, uh, we work in a very different way. So, you know, this is why we you know, created NetSuite all of those years ago. And those themes will continue to resonate and be strong messages for us and drive why we develop the features that we do. You know, visibility is key, you know, modernization and productivity. I mean, they're absolutely, you know, uh, top of mind um, with all of the organizations that we work with. So that's why we do it. And then driving features. I, just, I didn't want to dive into this one too much um, because um, you know, there's a lot of detail behind this, but, you know, I, I say this every time I do a kind of a roadmap or strategy presentation, that this isn't about what I think is a good idea for NetSuite. You know, it's, it's what our customers think is a good idea for the next things in, in NetSuite. And just to give you an idea, you know, there's many sources that we get this information from. It's our, our strategy as a business. We look at our addressable market, where, where we're going with our products. Um, we look at how, how we're growing, you know, the usage of NetSuite, our NPS scores. We speak to business analysts. We look at business trends. Uh, so we take a lot of things from a lot of areas. But most importantly, and I want to stress this again today, um, it's our customers. So if there's anything that you think we're not doing or you think you'd like to see in NetSuite, please do take the opportunity to speak to RSM. You know, that information gets to us and that's how we get better and we deliver the right features. Um, it's of critical importance to us. So, as I say, you know, hopefully you've seen some good things today. If there's things that we're not doing or you think we should consider, please, please do talk to us um, because we will take that information on board to try and drive a better product. Um, what we do from that point is we look at major vertical themes. As I've said, that's important to us, whether you work in a software business, uh, manufacturing, food and beverages, um, nonprofits. We look at how we deliver products to benefit each of those uh, verticals. 
and then we kind of have a, a bottom-up approach you know again back to that original slide one of the original slides i showed you it's about analytics it's about experience intelligence and also then how we deliver you know this capability via our very flexible platform we layer on our international expectations and then we look at um, themes and as you've said today tim spoke about smart financials and operational automation and John you know, kind of segued into kind of autonomous supply chain and some of those other areas of, uh, around WD, et cetera. So, you know, it, it's the way in which we carve up the features that we deliver. We obviously deliver a lot of stuff um, within the product, but we want to make sure that you get value from it and understand which of those things would be important for you and, and your businesses. Now, um, just on this slide there's a huge amount of detail so i won't dwell on it i'm sure rsm will make the slides available but these are how we break our individual features down into those discrete uh, kind of themes um, and then also looking at what we're delivering now in the next releases then into the future um what i wanted to do, do is just pick out a couple of key things that that, that we're doing that you can expect in 21.2 and, and and beyond um as I say, because there's a raft of stuff that we're working on. Uh, pay link on invoice is, a, is an interesting one. You know, we, we, we've seen, you know, a, a big requirement in this area where you have an invoice. Um, we have a capability that we're delivering now, which has a link, a pay link um, uh, option within the invoice itself, which you can click on and then the customer can make payment automatically on that invoice. Um, we've seen a lot of requests for that, you know, it's around automation, making things easier, helping DSO, that type of stuff. So we expect to see that one coming. Uh, Tim spoke about cash management. One of the other things that we'd be delivering in 21.2 is automatic cash application. Uh, so automatically applying uh, cash again to uh, invoices within next week uh, as part of our reconciliation process. So um, you'll see that coming as well. So conscious of time, so I'm not going to delve into each of these, but this is some of the stuff that you can expect. Hopefully you'll see something that resonates with you. And again, back to my point, if there isn't something in here um, that you would like, then please do speak to us. RSM did a great job of talking about 21.1. I, I did note that, that Tim uh, said this was a lighter release in terms of what we've delivered. It's a great point. One of the things that we're actually trying to do is be more targeted with the things that we deliver. Um, so it will be a trend that we see. Um, we want to deliver the right types of features. Um, kind of a metric that I'm judged on is by how many customers use the things that we build. Um, so what we're doing is we're looking very, very closely about the stuff that we, we, we develop. Um, is it the right thing? Um, and does it have the most value to the most of our customers? So, you know, we, we, we do deliver lots of things. We deliver lots of enhancements and fixes, but, you know, we will be looking at how we deliver the right things and making sure that, that, that we get maximum value. And as I say, just a couple of things that are important here for us, email approvals, um, you know, uh, uh, pack station, as John talked you through some of those areas. So a good release, and hopefully you'll take something from it um, moving forward. On ter in terms of our technology strategy, again, just pre-lunch, I don't want to get into too much technology, um, but there's a couple of things that are important to know, uh, again, about how we extend our footprint and how we, you know, ensure that, that, that NetSuite keeps you compliant and also how we can leverage some of the other things within the Oracle family, which is of great benefit to us and our customers. Um, so our technology consists of a number of things. There's infrastructure, there's our Suite Cloud platform, which enables our extensibility and configuration. There's analytics, there's intelligence, and there's experience. I'm going to talk a, not about all of these things, just a couple of areas, a little bit on infrastructure, um, a little bit about Suite Cloud, and, and touch a little bit on experience. So if I jump straight in, we, we often talk about our data centers, um, but there, there is a, a, a slight change coming up within the next month or two. 
Um, obviously, because we have this small matter of Brexit that, that we were working through in the UK, we obviously established a, a, a London data centre um, where we could house our customers' data. Um, what we needed to do in the in the advent of Brexit and some of the things that potentially that, that could happen, we did want to have the capability to retain data solely within the UK. So one of the things that will happen in the next month or two is that we've got an additional uh, data centre being opened in Cardiff, um, which will give us a full replication and, and DR scenario for our London-based data. Um, so that, that will be, be a new addition to, to what we do. What we'll also see is it's everything over the course of the next 12, 18 months um, transitioning over to OCI, so Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. And again, I think Tim mentioned a little bit about multi-tenancy, et cetera. That's all being powered by Oracle technology. So the biggest customers in the world are operating on Oracle infrastructure. That same infrastructure will be available to every single one of our NetSuite customers, large and small. Um, so that will be a nice thing. We will be transitioning all of our customers um, to OCI. And many of you will be part of that process. It will be a collaborative process uh, with minimal downtime. And we will be issuing more instruction on that in the coming months as to when we'll be transitioning. Uh, so, as I said, in terms of our, uh, our cloud platform, uh, there's a couple of things that we're doing. And again, this kind of relates to, you know, targeting new features. We are part of Oracle who have some great technology. So just a couple of things that we're adding that, that some of you may not be aware of, uh, but will give us, uh, you know, some considerable capability. Uh, the first one is, is NetSuite Oracle Integration Cloud or OIC, so don't get too mixed up and worried about all of the acronyms, OIC, OCI, OCE, et cetera. Um, but Oracle Integration Cloud is leveraging, um, you know, some Oracle capabilities for integration points with NetSuite. So essentially what it is, is we will be delivering some pre-built adapters. So you may be using some other line of business applications um, yourselves, you know, whether that could be Salesforce or it could be another ERP, whatever it is, NetSuite will start uh, delivering pre-built um, integration connectors, um, which will essentially be plug and play. Um, that will connect to a third party application. We will own that integration, um, but it will be built on or Oracle's integration cloud. Um, we're quite excited by it. You know, we will be starting to deliver a number of these um, uh, integrations in the, in the coming months. And also as a wider you know, kit bag, if you will, you know, we will be um, allowing customers to build you know, bespoke integrations as they need using OIC. So you can have all of that integration um, built on, on our Oracle NetSuite cloud infrastructure. So quite exciting. The other thing that we're doing is a NetSuite data warehouse powered by Oracle Analytics Cloud. Um, so again, this is going to be, be popular. You know, it's extended some of the capabilities that we've had uh, with NSPB, et cetera. Um, but in essentially allow, uh, using Oracle Analytics Cloud and some of the great things that they can do in terms of uh, machine learning, you know, uh, uh, data profiling, et cetera, to be able to take data from multiple sources, including NetSuite, and obviously deliver that to our users uh, and power users uh, in terms of analytical capabilities, so data analysis and collaboration. So another nice feature that you can expect, again, leveraging some uh, Oracle technology. Uh, and finally, on the Oracle uh, front, um, we delivered at 20.2 our first integration with OCE, or Oracle Content and Experience Cloud. Um, so really, this is a, a content management capability um, that we have. Um, so a full CMS, document management, digital asset management. Uh, you can maintain sites, um, websites, um, you know, conversations, collaboration, conversations, approval workflows. So any document management um, uh, uh, requirements that you have in your organization can be leveraged using OCE. One of the first things that we did as well to make it easier for our customers was expose this to a number of project records at 20.2 and we will be integrating it 
more readily with a number of other NetSuite records as we go through the release cycles. Um, but we're quite excited by this one, and I think this will give a, a number of additional capabilities to our customers. So watch out for, for more work with OCE. So finally, um, uh, the, the, the last thing that I want to talk about was reimagining experience. And I've actually got an offer as well for everybody on, 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 the, on the call today as well. What's hugely important for us um, at, at NetSuite today is experience, um, you know, particularly as, again, as everybody is working at home in different locations, you know, we're really looking long and hard about how people use NetSuite and also the user interface. Um, you know, we've been in the cloud uh, for 20 years, you know, we, we, we developed our, our product, you know, well ahead of the cloud curve. Um, what we want to do is do some modernization. Um, and so we are reimagining uh, the user experience. So here's some screen grabs of some of the things that we've been working on in terms of our UI. We have introduced a new user interface framework in the background that's, that will be seamless to you. And every new feature that we do uh, will use our new UI components to improve the look and feel. You know, we want people to enjoy using the application. Now, part of this is, is helped and driven by our user experience and design team, or what we call our XD team. Um, they're a team who look at NetSuite holistically, look at usage of Net, uh, NetSuite holistically, but also look at, uh, again, about design patterns. And we have some um, user experience experts whose sole purpose is to look at how we deliver our UI and how we deliver them more. Um, overt experience of using NetSuite. You know, they sit down with users. Is this area, does it take too many clicks? Is this screen intuitive? Do I have to go through three levels of menu to find the things that I need? And they will come back to us and we will put that into our design patterns and deliver a, a better user experience for our customers. What we're keen to do is talk to customers. Um, you know, we, free of charge, will, will um, importantly, um, allow access to our experienced design team who will sit down with you virtually if you'd like to speak to them and go through your usage of NetSuite. Um, if anybody's interested in working with us, we'll happily organise that. Speak to the guys at RSM and we can have a collaborative session and look at your usage. You know, if there's things that you don't like, we use it as a feedback session as well. And we bring that back into my teams in product development. We look at how we can improve the experience of NetSuite. So, you know, please look out for, for future updates in terms of the, the, the UI. But also, if you're interested in talking to us on a bit more of a detailed level, I know we've all got day jobs, um, but even an hour or two, we're happy to do. Please reach out to us or speak to RSM and we'll be happy to help you. Um, I know I've gone a little bit over and I apologise for that. Um, you know, thank you for listening. Um, thank you to RSM. And again, I'd urge you all, if there's anything that you've seen here today, please talk to us or, or, or our RSM, most importantly, um, and we're happy to help. So with that, I'll say again, thank you and hand back to Adil. Thank you, James. Uh, thank you, Tim. And thank you, John, uh, for the presentation and the slots. Um, we hope you have found the content or some nuggets of information that we've presented useful. Uh, from a question perspective, we are quite light on questions, but we did receive a question around the um, uh, country specific reporting um, and whether there's native reports already in the system. And the answer is yes, for France and Germany, there are native reports that use the, the new uh, framework, uh, which you'll be able to uh, customize and, and simplify if you require. Um, finally, I would um, implore everyone who's, who's joined to please feedback to us. Um, we want to make these sessions as relevant, as useful to you. Um, so we want to ensure we're covering the right topics. Um, 
So please do reach out to us if there are topics that you want to find out more information about. A common one that we come across a lot of the time is around intercompany. If that's if that's a key one that you want to find more information about, uh, and especially because the product is evolving quite rapidly in this area, or taxation, if that's something that you're interested in, then please do reach out to us. Tim has produced a Brexit paper, um, so if you're interested in in receiving that and the implications of what you should be doing from an NetSuite perspective, um, then please do reach out, and we're happy to send that across to you. Um, but the key key point from my perspective is feedback. Please, please do reach out to us. We do want to make this as relevant. We want to make it as useful for you and, and making sure that you're receiving the, the best value for, from these sessions. Um, and as I mentioned at the top of the, the call, um, we are optimistic. We're hopeful that the next ones will be able to be held face to face towards the end of the year. So, so please do join us. Um, hopefully that will make it a lot more interactive and you'll be able to see us and talk to us. Um, uh, and ensure that, that you're getting the best value from your net suite investment. Uh, my final point is um, we have a, an optimization or rapid assessment methodology in place. So if 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 there if you are feeling that you're not necessarily using um, NetSuite to the best of its ability and you're you're not necessarily taking advantage of the releases for years gone by, please do reach out to us. We have a methodology that we can help you out with to to recommend areas that you could improve efficiency within your system and making and make better use of your NetSuite instance. So I've got my contact details up on this slide and, and Tim as well. So so please do reach out to us if there's anything you want to find out more information about um, and feedback to us about future sessions, please do. Um, and we'll definitely take that into consideration. So I'll let everyone uh, go and get some lunch now, but thank you very much for, for joining us. And, and we do hope that you found it useful. Thank you.